Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nisha Abkarian, and I'm so happy to welcome you to today's program. I'm the director of AJC Project Interchange, and I'm thrilled to see everyone here from alumni, honored speakers, AJC leaders, Project Interchange board members, staff, and many others on the call. This is the second session in our new sustainability series. And for anyone who missed the first session, which was fantastic, which focused on climate change, um, we're going to drop a link in the chat so that you can check it out at your convenience. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lily Kalish Gersh, Director of Alumni Engagement for Project Interchange. Lily. Thank you, Nisha. Today we'll hear from two speakers, Zach Fenster and Oda Distel. Each of our panelists will speak for 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. You're invited to submit your own questions at any time during the program using Zoom's Q&A feature. Zach Fenster is VP of Business Development at Watergen, a pioneering Israeli company that has become the global leader in the atmospheric drinking water devices market, machines that create drinking water from the air. He previously served as Chief of Staff to the Chairman of Watergen. Prior to that, Zach served in the Israeli Defense Ministry's coordination for government activities in the Territories Unit. He holds a BA from Middlebury College and an MA from Tel Aviv University. Zach, the floor is yours. Thanks, Billy. Uh, and thank you, Nisha. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Uh, I can't see you, but I hope you can see and hear me okay. Um, and it's really always exciting to present WaterGen and this amazing Israeli technology in general, but all the more so um, to a group uh, of alumni of AJC um, alums who um, I'm sure have tons of knowledge and understanding about the Israeli tech space in general. And I think there's nothing more interesting than Israeli tech that's leveraged for good around the world. And that's exactly what we're doing at WaterGen. So I am going to jump into a presentation, um, which I hope you can see. And with that, we are going to begin. Um, so WaterGen. WaterGen is, in short, the global leader today in what's called atmospheric water generation, or in simpler words, drinking water from the air. Um, and we've pioneered that technology for a really important and basic goal. As we're going to see in a second, the global drinking water crisis is, despite, you know, how severe and crazy the world is right now with COVID, I think the most pressing issue is actually the drinking water crisis. Um, and it's a crisis which unfortunately is only just beginning to be recognized. It was made a uh, UN Sustainable Development Goal uh, several years ago, but the UN has announced that they're well behind um, solving this issue. And um, this is a really, really serious crisis that unfortunately is only getting worse and worse. So we at WaterGen are motivated by the vision of our owner and president, Dr. Michael Mirilashvili, who has really steered WaterGen towards the fundamental mission of completely solving that drinking water crisis and bringing access to clean drinking water um, to everyone in the world, no matter who they are. Um, so uh, this is who we are. This is our motto, creating drinking water from air for people everywhere. And let's dive in and see a little bit more about what that's about. So from the dawn of human civilization, water access has been about two things. Uh, it's what we like to call the water equation. The first is that you need a source, right? And this is why cities, towns, etc., always um, were located around some type of drinking water source. But you need something in addition to that source. You need some way to transport that source from its origin to where people use it. And this is where, why we see you know, ancient aqueducts in um, ancient Rome and many other types of systems that you see around the world in different times and in different eras. Um, but what you find out and what sort of the layperson might be less familiar with, but which is 
what's absolutely critical is that that transportation system is just as important as having the source itself. Um, now let's start with the source. Unfortunately, as many of us, I think, know that source is running out around the world and it's running out both in richer countries and less wealthy countries. And why it's running out, we can talk about it. There, there are a bunch of different factors. Certainly a couple of them are the rise in global population, a rising middle class is also uh, demanding more water. So demand is getting much higher. Um, and that demand is getting higher as global temperatures are rising, which means there's more evaporation. Um, rising demand also means that uh, oftentimes there's ill-advised use of that water source. So people are over pumping, depleting, and really using the water without a sustainable um, framework in mind. Sustainability is obviously a really important theme today. And sustainable water use is something that we are absolutely focused on. Unfortunately, is not something that we see very often in the world today. And what we know is that not only is that source running out, that first part of the equation, but also we have a serious transportation problem. And this problem is actually almost even more severe in developed countries than it is in non-developed countries. Um, you know, in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, in Australia, the vast majority of water infrastructure, the pipes that bring that uh, source of water to the people who need that water, they were built decades ago. They were built with metal and they're old. And they actually poison, those pipes can poison the water on its way from the source to the end user. And so we're seeing around the world caused by stories that I'm sure you guys are familiar with in Flint, in Newark, in California, right, of serious water quality problems. And that's just, unfortunately, the tip of the iceberg. We're seeing a dwindling of consumer confidence, of civilian confidence in the water quality, in the quality of the water that's coming out of pipes. And instead, because people don't trust the water um, coming out of the pipes, they're turning to bottled solutions. And the problem is that, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, that creates a major environmental problem. Those plastics never go away. They never disappear. And so with the dwindling uh, confidence in uh, the water coming out of the pipes, we're seeing a corresponding spike in plastic um, uh, pollution around the world. So water is not a given, as we're seeing. And both the source and the transportation, our ability to, to provide answers to those um, to both of those sides of the equation are unfortunately um, not working anymore. So trillions of dollars have been spent, um, you know, by both local, national, um, and even international governing bodies, and yet this disaster is only getting worse. So what we at WaterGen believe is that we need to completely rethink this paradigm. We need to completely reshape that water equation that I was speaking about before. And we do that by basically offering a totally revolutionary answer, both to the problem of source, of a water source, and to the problem of transportation. On the level of source, what our technology, which I'm gonna to get to in a, a moment, enables us to do, is to actually convert the air that you breathe into the water that you drink. Um, or going one level deeper, the humidity um, in the air that you breathe, and that is all around us, into the water that you drink. And so rather than that source being in some faraway location, it's actually all around us. And because it's all around us, that's the answer to the second question of transportation. You don't need a sophisticated, a sophisticated mechanism of transportation. You produce the water right where you need it, be it in your home, in your office, in schools, in hospitals, in army bases, on the go, we'll get to in a second. So that's our fundamental innovation um, and the tremendous uh, power of WaterGen solutions. And before we actually get to what those solutions are and what the technology is, the benefits of creating drinking water from air through WaterGen solution are huge. We have a premium quality drinking water solution. Our um, 
our uh, water has passed the highest standards and certifications of drinking water around the world. We are eco-friendly because first of all, we're the most um, energy efficient solution and also because we eliminate all of that plastic waste. You don't need to carry around bottles anymore, plastic bottles. Um, we're safe and we're accessible. And the access is something that's really important to stress because, you know, unfortunately in the States, for example, we just saw um, recently another incredibly scary and powerful um, example of why our traditional form of bringing water to people no longer works. And that's what happened in Texas, right? When the pipes froze and when the electricity went out, people didn't have water for days. Um, and so a accessible and decentralized solution, one which is based in individual people's homes so that if there's some major problem with the central water grid, they can still get water. That's a major benefit of drinking water from the air. I'm going to pass through these slides, but we've had many major milestones. WaterGen was founded in 2009, so our um, technology has been in development for over 10 years. And in recognition of that technology's impact and significance, we've received a range of really amazing um, international awards. You can see a couple of them here. There's more. One that's not here, but one that uh, we're super proud of is that um, on the 70th uh, birthday or anniversary of Israel's independence, um, so almost three years ago, uh, the Ministry of Economy released a poll which uh, went to citizens, anyone could vote, asking them to choose the most um, amazing innovations that had come out of Israel in the course of the 70 year history. And WaterGen was chosen as one of the seven most amazing, powerful, important Israeli innovations ever created in the history of the state. So, so I think that definitely speaks to WaterGen really being at the tip of that sort of startup nation culture um, and particularly for, for, for a good purpose. We're worldwide. Uh, we operate currently in more than 80 countries around the world. We have several manufacturing facilities around the world. Uh, and you can see here that we're working not only in the United States, Europe, um, and other very developed countries, right? Oftentimes people think that the water uh, crisis is only something that exists in poor countries. That's absolutely not the case. You can see a really great mix here. And you could also see that um, on the heels of the Abraham Accords, and even before that, WaterGen was doing work even um, in countries that uh, with which Israel does not have diplomatic relations because we are the solution that they need and ultimately the um, need to access clean drinking water really transcends, I think, those political positions. So let's jump in a little bit to that unique technology, how we do this uh, and how it works. So here you can see, there's actually a video which I can absolutely share um, later on in the chat, or if you write me, um, I can send it to you, but I'm not gonna test Zoom's uh, bandwidth right now. Um, but you can see very simply here, a sort of uh, framework of how all of our machines work. Step one is that our machines draw the air inside. And even before turning it into water, we, we filter the air. And that's an important piece because we're oftentimes asked well, if you're turning the air that we breathe into our drinking water source, then what about air pollution? And the answer is that the quality of the air does not impact the quality of the water. And there are a bunch of reasons for that, but it starts right here in the filtration of the air. Then the air goes through our patented, um, internationally patented technology. We're gonna get to that on the next slide, but we call that the genius. It's our unique heat exchanger. And that's what actually turns the humidity in the air into water. And then once the water has been produced, it goes through a water uh, treatment, maintenance, and mineralization unit. It's what you could see in step three. That unit, in addition to continuing to make sure that the water that you're gonna drink is of the best possible quality, it also actually adds really important minerals like magnesium, potassium, and calcium into the water. 
so that your body is receiving all of the important vitamins that we get from our water because when you're taking water from the air, it's actually fuel. So the minerals that you get from water, you need to add. And then finally, the water is dispensed. Depending on the machine, um, the water will be either uh, cold and ambient or cold and hot. Oops, sorry. Um, so as I mentioned, the second step of that slide was our unique technology. And that technology is the genius. The genius is the name that we've given uh, what is really the heart of our technology and what we do as a company. It's um, a globally patented technology. At this point, there are dozens of patents that we've already received, many more on the way, which uh, protect the first heat exchanger ever designed um, to actually create drinking water from air. You can find heat exchangers that are very sort of standard and non-innovative in you know, household appliances like air conditioners, humidifiers, dryers, etc. And in fact, as many of you know, if you have an AC running on a hot, humid day, you might see even little drops of water, right? The problem is that you wouldn't want to drink that water and that the water is a byproduct. And the major technological challenge that WaterGen looks to solve and has solved is how to actually completely redesign that heat exchanger in order to make it a solution to the drinking water crisis. And that's what we've done. We've done it by, first of all, changing what a heat exchanger is made out of. Traditionally, it's made out of metal, which is bad for drinking water. Um, the genius our heat exchanger is made out of a food grade polymer. It's the only heat exchanger in the world to be made out of a food grade polymer. And it means that, as you'll see in a second, we're by far the market leader in our water quality. And we also changed the design and the shape uh, of that heat exchanger so that we can A, produce water at an, impress at an um, unprecedented electrical efficiency. We are on average five times more efficient than any other heat exchanger in the world. And that's important because um, energy or electricity is money. And so the more energy that you need to produce water, the more expensive your water is. And Lastly, uh, with the genius, we can actually create significant amounts of drinking water, even when it's very dry, right? Even when it's 15% humidity, 20% humidity. And that's really important to be able to deploy in all those places that I just showed you and the many more that we hope to, to deploy in. So that's our unique technology. And what it powers is to summarize our market leading uh, performance in drinking water quality, electrical efficiency, and the ability to produce in very different types of atmospheric conditions. As you can see here, because of, of that first um, um, characteristic, we've received um, these, which are leading international certifications and many, many more. And when you create this new alternative source of clean drinking water, the applications are endless. When you're offering a new source and a new transportation system, it's really, it, the list goes on and on and on. I'm going to get straight to the products because I don't want to go too over time. Um, and thank you, Lily. Um, so I'm going to get going, but we could talk more about the applications later. Suffice it to say that they're all over. Now we've taken that genius and we've deployed it in a bunch of different solutions. Our outdoor solutions um, for schools, hospitals, um, universities, public spaces, um, army, police, emergency response and crisis response, like what happened in Texas, and many, many more are the two machines you see here in the center and left, the Gen L and the Gen M. The Gen M is also, it was actually developed according to military specifications. And therefore, it's a very durable, flexible machine. And so you can also actually put it on the back um, of a mobile bed like this, hook it up to an electric generator and you have a mobile uh, drinking water creation unit. Um, I think that um, a link is gonna be sent right after my presentation with an amazing video of a project that we're doing with the Ford Foundation um, and an organization called World Vision in South Africa in order to, um, basically with this configuration, in order to bring water to communities there. 
And then we have two other amazing sort of genres uh, or categories of product. The first is consumer products. And we're launching now the Watergen Jenny, which is a home and office unit for indoor use. It's taken us a little bit longer because being able to produce that much water inside is a whole even more sophisticated technolog uh, technological challenge. And then we actually have developed in conjunction with some of the world's biggest um, car makers, we've developed a range of automotive solutions that are deployed even in either inside of cars for you to drink when you're on the go, or what's called aftermarket, which can essentially be attached to the roof of a, an RV, uh, a recreational vehicle, trucks, buses, and even trains and yachts. Uh, so this is sort of getting deeper into the actual um, product. I'm going to skip over this. And I want to just summarize by saying um, what are sort of the core um, effects of Watergen solution and of creating your drinking water from the air in, in an effective and scalable way. Like I mentioned, first of all, it's a decentralized solution, which means that you at home have complete control of your drinking over your drinking water source, just as many of you might have or be interested in having um, an electrical generator as a backup to your electrical supply because you don't want to be fully dependent on the central grid. Watergen lets you do that for your water. Uh, it's convenient. It's plug in and uh, play or rather drink. I didn't get into this, but um, as I mentioned a little bit, there is no need for any water infrastructure, for any piping, for anything like that. You plug in our solution and several mo moments later, you have clean drinking water, cold, hot, that you can drink. Um, and it's a new source. And I think that that's really important for this sort of sustainability uh, issue that we're talking about today. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, much of the world's uh, water sources are be many of the world's water sources are being extremely overstressed. And offering a new source that also gives the opportunity to um, have those more traditional water sources be rehabilitated is really a, an important advantage as well. We're extremely environmentally friendly, again, because of that energy efficiency and also because of our ability to eliminate the dependence on plastic bottles. Our water has the best international certifications and is completely safe. Uh, we have, I think, some of the most sophisticated and advanced labs here at, inside of Watergen's offices in all of Israel. Um, and it's something that we've uh, dedicated a tremendous amount of time and energy to. And finally, as I mentioned, you, you saw um, uh, some of our products. The applications of this solution are endless. And we have small solutions for smaller needs, big solutions for bigger needs. We have mobile solutions for on the go, and we have stationary solutions, so it's really endless. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you, um, and we'll be sticking around after um, to take any questions and have a conversation. Thank you, Zach. What an amazing innovation. I know our audience will have lots of questions for you, but first, sure. it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Oded Distel. Oded Distel is a leading expert on Israel's water and energy sectors. He became the CEO of Talia, a new earth-friendly agritech solution that enhances naturally occurring processes and plants in July, 2019. In 2007, he founded and became the director of Israel New Tech, a pioneering national program led by the Israeli Ministry of Economy and Industry that seeks smart solutions to global challenges. Oded holds a BA in Business Administration and an MBA from the College of Management Academic Studies. Oded, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lily. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, good evening here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, your time. And uh, we switched the, or you switched the time. I'm, I was confused. So I apologize for uh, being a little bit uh, late. <clears throat> and uh, I'm uh, honored to present uh, here today. And I'll uh, share my screen. Minute. Um, OK. 
Okay, are we, Lily, can you see my screen? Looks great. Yes, okay, perfect. So after this uh, um, uh, introduction by Lily, I got a little bit blush, but uh, I'll uh, try to get over it. And uh, I will uh, present uh, Talia, and uh, later on during the uh, Q&A, we can go also a little bit to my uh, part, uh, the part in my career when I was in the government and uh, dealing with the uh, Israeli water uh, ecosystem. Uh, so Talia is uh, in the agro sector and uh, as you can see, it's all about uh, the beauty and power of simplicity. And uh, I take a uh, big pride in uh, being uh, simple and having a, a product. Sometimes it uh, uh, can cause some uh, obstacles with the investors, but from uh, the point of view of the end client, the farmer and the environment, it's a, a huge uh, advantage. And let me explain what you can see here, down here around this uh, avocado tree, this is uh, our product, it's called Mitra, and uh, Mitra in uh, Greek is a wound. And uh, this is exactly uh, what we do to uh, young trees, like, uh, like a mother taking very good care of her uh, young babies. This is what we do for uh, young trees and, uh, and vegetable plants. And I'll uh, explain. Ah, okay, this is uh, uh, me in uh, my uh, previous career. Uh, I assume you can recognize the, the flag at the back. So it was, uh, I think, a conference uh, somewhere in uh, either Texas or Arizona. Uh, and this is already the bigger picture is from uh, a pilot that uh, we are uh, running in uh, India. And this is uh, about a year ago, a little bit more, just before the COVID uh, stopped us from uh, traveling. Um, so, agriculture is under tremendous uh, pressure globally, and uh, uh, we see it uh, everywhere. Uh, issues of uh, climate change, uh, Zach to talked about uh, water resources, so agriculture takes 70% of the total water consumption globally. So you can imagine what does it mean that uh, we have water shortage, uh, so agriculture suffers uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, the uh, growing population, change in uh, uh, habits around the world, all of it uh, creates uh, tremendous pressure uh, on agriculture. Uh, it is everywhere, but obviously in the uh, developing world, it is even worse. But same story, more or less, is happening also uh, in the US, in Australia, in Brazil, uh, and other places. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll uh, try to shortly describe uh, what we do. Um, and basically, what we do is we create ideal microclimates to the root zone of, uh, as I said, young trees and vegetable plants. Uh, and roots are always the, the engine, the heart of the plant, and it's also the hidden part, which means that uh, uh, it is very tricky to create those ideal microclimates at the same time, it is very important and crucial in order to reach a healthy, a growing plants and trees. So what do we do in Talia? So we work simultaneously and synergetically with nature in order to achieve all those wonderful things that I'm going to describe. And even though the product itself, the technology itself, is extremely simple, the fact that we work with the most 
sophisticated, accurate, uh, um, modern system, which is Mother Nature, delivers uh, phenomenal results. So one, we take all source of water and we direct it through gravitation to the root zone. And it can be rain or dew or uh, drip irrigation or uh, sprinklers, doesn't matter. And then the process of evaporation that happens all the time, and by evaporation, we lose a lot of the water that we use in order to irrigate the trees. In the Talia case, it, the evaporation is blocked and then the water goes back to the, to the, to the uh, root zone. So we save a lot of water. And then what happens is we prevent weeds from growing all around uh, the tree, which means that the tree has no competition over water and, and nutrition uh, and, and other resources. Uh, and the farmer can save a lot on uh, fertilizers and pesticides. So it's, uh, uh, he can save on his uh, um, expenses. And the environment is also um, gaining because excessive use of chemicals in agriculture is the number one cause for uh, contamination in groundwater, surface water, and soil. So we are good for the environment uh, as well. We mitigate all type of radical uh, temperatures because of the air that is under this year. And we create ideal uh, soil health for the plant. So all of it together is the thing that what I'm, I'm describing as ideal microclimate to the root zone. <clears throat> Bottom line from the uh, farmer point of view is that he's getting his trees and vegetable plants grow faster, healthier, bear fruits uh, faster, and uh, more and better uh, yield. So the ROI is very clear and it is totally modular, meaning it can be implemented in very small plots of small holders in different parts of the world. And it can be implemented in very large uh, orchards in California uh, or uh, Arizona and places as such. Uh, in this picture, you can see immediately the impact that the mitra uh, creates around the, the, uh, uh, the roots. So this is a, a picture that we took just after taking off the, uh, the mitra and you can see the soil. The soil is very fluffy. It's moist. It, there is a lot of moisture there, a lot of oxygen exactly what uh, the roots and the tree need in order to flourish and to grow. <clears throat> Those are numbers from uh, a pilot that we did um, just before the corona in, uh, in, in India, in Andhra Pradesh, with uh, Tata Trust and uh, Tel Aviv University. The important numbers are here. What you can see here is uh, numbers in kilogram per plant of tomatoes. And you can see here the three different plots. So plot A is just uh, open field tomatoes with drip irrigation. Plot B, open field with irrigation with mulch, which is the plastic nylons that the farmers uh, use. And plot C, same story, without much, with uh, our mitras, with uh, uh, around, uh, around the tomato plants. And the result, as you can see, is the regular field, A, almost two kilogram, plot B, 3.6, and the Talia case, 11.6. Now the numbers are totally crazy. But those are figures that we got from uh, the Tata Trust uh, people. 
And probably there was something radical happening during this uh, period of cultivation, maybe a heat wave, maybe the farmer forgot to uh, open the, the, the irrigation system. But nevertheless, what happened is that in the Talia case, we were able to mitigate all those extreme uh, uh, conditions and create and, and balance it uh, throughout the uh, productive period. Uh, I'll share with you a few uh, photos from uh, projects around the world. Uh, this is in Israel, in the Negev. So we are ideal, obviously, for uh, very hot uh, water stress uh, conditions. And this is uh, growing avocado in the desert, something very, uh, very nice. Uh, and this is a project in uh, New Mexico with the pecan uh, growers in the uh, New Mexico State University. Uh, it's about a year-old uh, pilot, uh, so it's on the progress uh, with the very positive first uh, results. Um, project in Italy, and a project uh, that I'm very proud of, it's uh, in Azerbaijan with the Red Cross, uh, supporting a small village on the border area, and they grow uh, pecan, uh, sorry, almonds there. In terms of uh, different uh, crops, we, we are uh, ideal for all types of uh, fruit trees. So citrus, avocado, mango, all type of uh, nuts and almonds. And uh, vegetables, this is the uh, preparation for the uh, field test in, uh, for the pilot in India. So you can see it can be also installed uh, very dense, one next to the other. And this is the way they grow the tomatoes. Um, obviously, uh, grapes uh, are very important uh, and can be used with the coffee, tea, cacao, um, many type of uh, uh, crops around the world. Um, in terms of uh, future uh, plans, so <clears throat> The U.S. is uh, a huge market that we are just starting to, uh, to enter. We work in, uh, in India. Uh, we are entering uh, Africa. And Tania uh, can be one of the answers to the very stressful situation of small, uh, small holders uh, around the world where they have uh, huge difficulties meeting uh, demand and competing in the, uh, in the global markets. Uh, so I will stop sharing here, really, and uh, I give you back the floor. Thank you so much. Audience, it's your turn. Please submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen indicating who the question is for. I'll get us started. This is for both of you. And let's see if we can get Zach back on our screen. Israel is known as the innovation nation. Could these technologies have emerged anywhere else or do they reflect Israel's pro-innovation policies? Oded, do you wanna start? Hmm. Uh, so I would say um... There is a culture in, in Israel that supports uh, innovation and uh, I wouldn't say that people in Israel are more gifted or talented from people in other places, no. But there is a culture that people can say, uh, I have an idea, I can pursue, I can take it from uh, being an idea all the way to implementation. And you can look around and see role models in almost every type of uh, sector that you can imagine. Uh, obviously ICT and agro and water and energy and transportation and whatever. 
So I think uh, the ability to take an idea uh, from scratch and make it uh, make a product, make a business case out of it um, is relatively more comfortable in Israel compared to other places. Zach, would you like to add anything? I'd agree with everything that Oded said, and I would just add that I think uh, one of the reasons that that culture developed and um, and was sort of um, supported and and uh, grew here is because of need, right? I mean, water gen, I think, is the most uh, recent and relevant example of a more than 70-year history of um, innovation uh, that really pushed the world in terms of water technology. And that's because, as I'm sure I don't need to explain to our audience, water gens founding um, and its first decades, uh, um, water gen, uh, what, excuse me, Israel faced uh, a huge uh, water deficit and, it, was, and it, it needed to figure out how to innovate out of those problems. And, and that's true for many other parts of Israel's sort of innovation uh, ecosystem as well. So I think, you know, need and empowering people to create solutions leads to great innovation. And I think, um, I think that's something that exists here. Thank you so much. Our next question from, comes from a member of the PI board, Bill Stern in Chicago. Bill asks Zach, Please discuss the recent donation by Israel of two of your devices to Colombia. Um, great question. So, so this is really just the most recent um, example, I think, of what Israel is doing around the world um, to address drinking water problems. I mentioned Texas. Colombia is another great example. They unfortunately, first of all, there's just sort of a, uh, there is a chronic water problem in Colombia as there is in, in many other places around the world. And that chronic pro problem can also become very acute with storms and all sorts of other situations. We recently delivered two machines to a really water stressed community. Um, and we worked together with the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, our local distributor, um, and local authorities on the ground in order to bring that technology there. Um, and that's something that we're doing in many places around the world. Again, with two, I would say, really important um, goals in mind. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the vision uh, of our owner uh, and president is to completely solve the drinking water crisis and projects like this do that. And the second is that that solution comes from Israel, from here. You know, WaterGen has received many offers to move elsewhere. And maybe from a sort of purely economic standpoint, that might, that might make sense. But the opportunity to execute projects like that one in Colombia from Israel um, and to create those types of connections is something that to us is much more important than any you know, potential benefit to move somewhere else. That's, that's what we're all about. And we're gonna continue um, to do those types of projects with partners around the world in order to bring that solution uh, to people who need it. Thank you. Uh, Zach, while I have you, I am getting a question from PI alumna Madeline Ruggiero, who asks, how and where do you order these products, particularly for personal use and automobiles or RVs? Great question. So um, the two bigger machines, which I uh, introduced are commercially available. And while they're sort of too big for an individual person, um, you know, I'm sure everyone in the audience belongs to a community, a school, some type of institution that they belong to. And I'm sure that uh, that institution would benefit from, from that type of uh, technology. And it'd be my pleasure to connect offline. Um, I can put my email in the chat as well so that anyone who wants it has it, um, and we can talk about that. The Jenny, that consumer product that I mentioned, is actually about to be launched in April. We've unfortunately had a couple of delays over the last few months because of COVID, but um, we are back up and running, and it should be launched um, 
in a month's time. And the automotive solutions are, anyone who knows anything about the automotive industry knows that it, any sort of process to deploy products there takes a long time. We've already been working with several players for two years now, even more. Um, but the first cars will actually, that actually deploy these, the, the water gun solutions will probably be hitting the market somewhere uh, in late 2022, early 2023, um, except for the aftermarket device, which I mentioned before, which is sort of, rather than it being integrated into the car, it's actually sort of on the roof and another pieces inside of your RV uh, or your truck or your bus or whatever have you, that's coming out this year. Um, and that will be uh, available in garages that service those types of vehicles. So keep your eyes open. Uh, it's gonna hit the market soon. Um, and when it is, we'll of course love, love to have the people in the audience now be some of the first uh, users of those new innovative products. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alberto Ruiz in Mexico City, and it is for Oded. Understanding the rise in, pop, in world population and scarcity of arable soil, does your tech allow food to grow in soils previously thought unfit for agriculture? Your yield stats were amazing. Does this tech deplete the soil? Sure. <clears throat> so the... Uh... The technology allows uh, farmers to grow in areas that they could not uh, do that before uh, because one, uh, we overcome water uh, scarcity. Second, uh, the process of evaporation and condensation that I've mentioned overcome uh, soil salinity. So this is uh, very meaningful and it, the, the fact that we are able to support uh, growing avocado in, uh, in the Negev, in the desert, in Israel, means that uh, farmers in uh, relatively uh, tough, very tough conditions, uh, can be in Mexico, can be in India, can be in different places around the world, that were struggling in order to make a living, all of a sudden uh, can switch to uh, much more profitable uh, yields, and by that, uh, upgrading uh, dramatically their uh, life standards, uh, support uh, education for the children and all the positive things that we all uh, wish uh, for everybody around the world. Uh, so definitely the answer is, uh, is yes. And, and by the way, we have a, a distributor partner in, uh, in Mexico, that is running uh, for the last uh, year several uh, pilots in Mexico with the uh, citrus and uh, avocados. And again, uh, I'll be happy to uh, connect. Thank you so much. Our next question is from PI alumnus, David Gossick, and it is for Zach. Does water gen work in countries or environments that are not water stressed, but have only polluted water sources? Do you partner in programs that are health oriented such as focusing on mitigating waterborne illnesses in rural areas? Great question. Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. And one of the things that I was trying to get at in my presentation, which, which maybe wasn't clear, is that um, because of that water equation that we were talking about, that's basically the source plus the transportation, you can have a source that's clean, but if your transportation system be it pipes or even just in the ground, because groundwater is obviously one of the major sources of fresh drinking water in the world. If your ground is polluted like it was in Flint, right, with industrial waste, then that means that you might have a water source, but you can't drink it because it's been polluted. And that's just as much um, of our target uh, market, places that uh, have that type of problem as places that actually just don't have any water at all. Um, so that's a great question. And health is definitely um, a major focus of ours, I would say, in general, but particularly given the past year. Um, and what you see, I think, and, and this is intuitive to us, is that clean drinking water and health go hand in hand, right? So I'll just give one brief example. Another one of our uh, great projects has actually been in the Gaza Strip. We've actually done three projects so far. We have more coming on the way. The Gaza Strip 
um, has a really difficult water situation for various different reasons. Um, but the bottom line is that they have basically run out of the clean or the fresh water sources in the ground because of overstressed, uh, because they've been overstressed and the infrastructure system is very poor. Um, and during COVID, uh, hospitals and health clinics had to lock down, which means that the water suppliers who would deliver water couldn't come into the hospitals, right? So uh, we were approached by a hospital um, and ultimately actually placing two machines in hospitals. And what those machines do, they're located on the roof or right outside. We also, our third project is in a municipality. It gives people that independent water source and in the hospitals they're using it to drink, but in rural communities, they're oftentimes using our water supply to drink and also to wash their hands because that's incredibly critical for COVID as well. So, um, you know, we're focused on drinking water because we believe that that's the most important and highest quality water that we need. So it's the hardest one to get access to. Um, but you know, especially in a global pandemic, people are also using our water to wash their hands a little bit to make sure they're not caching anything, then, then that's great too. Thank you. I could sit here with you all day. We have so many questions, uh, but unfortunately our time is short. So our last question is coming from Jennifer in Boston and it's for Oded. Oded, can you speak with about Taya's collaboration with New Mexico State University studying agricultural sustainability and water saving technology? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, the cooperation with the New Mexico State University is, uh, from our point of view, is a strategic one, and uh, it's very obvious because for a small company, all the way from Israel with the extremely limited resources, the ability to come to the market with the validation from a very respectable institute like the New Mexico State University is. Uh, I don't know, it's diamond. And uh, uh, through the work with the New Mexico State University, we are also uh, in touch with the uh, Pecan uh, Growers Association uh, of New Mexico. Important to say uh, that, uh, I mean, for me, it was a, a, a new fact to learn that uh, uh, pecan in agriculture was uh, one of the pillars of the uh, New Mexico uh, economy. Uh, and the fact that uh, there is a, a wood, severe water shortage there uh, with the Colorado uh, River and all of this, the ability to say we can minimize dramatically the water consumption in, uh, in the pecan orchard uh, was a major fact that uh, pushed the university uh, in order to uh, take this uh, pilot and dedicate a team for the next uh, two years that is going to validate the technology. Thank you. Thank you both, Odette and Zach. It's been such a privilege to get such an in-depth look at these remarkable innovations. I wanna thank our audience as well for joining us today. Watch your email for the final session of our sustainability series on renewable energy. We also invite you to join us on April 5th for a discussion on the Israeli elections with AJC Jerusalem Director Avital Leibovich. The registration link will be in the chat. Alumni, don't forget to sign up for our private PI alumni Facebook and WhatsApp groups where you can interact in real time with our amazing international alumni community. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.